So thank you very much for uh, coming to my talk, I mean, online. And I will be speaking about, I think, a very different perspective uh, than the previous talks, because my background is very different, as I will be explaining, coming from medicine, psychiatry, neurology, and neuroscience. Uh, but I hope by the end that we will find that it's very, very important and interesting to have dialogue between people engaging in neuroscience and people engaging, engaging in language policy, language practice, uh, social linguistics, and so on. Uh, I put my Twitter below because I use Twitter quite a lot. So if you have any comments and so on, uh, you know, uh, please feel free to tweet and just tag me in because then I can retweet it. And after the talk, I'm always sending uh, links and so on to papers. Uh, studies I'm uh, telling about. And the second thing I want to stress is that this will be, I mean, for you who might have heard my you know, previous talks, this will be very different because, you know, one of the things I like about giving slide, giving presentations is to really think about the audience I'm speaking uh, to because they are very, very different. So I don't like talks which are a little bit like, you know, mic a food that you put into microwave and just warm up. I like talks which are really freshly cooked. So this is a freshly prepared talk and with some ideas which I haven't be expressed before. And that's why I hope that we will have really a good lively discussion. So I will start with my own path from medicine to language policy to, so to say, explain my credentials, why I think I have something to say to people who really work in this field. Then I, Move to speak about aphasia, which was the first topic of my studies uh, in uh, Freiburg in Breisgau in Germany and in Cambridge. And here, one of the kind of central thoughts of my talk is that, in fact, there is quite an important interaction between our theoretical views and approaches. In this case, I would kind of contrast sociolinguistics with some, you know, theories of cognitive. Uh, neurolinguistic that I was exposed to, let's say, in the 80s, and that it does have implications from a global perspective. So there will be like two currents in my talk, and I hope by the end you will find that indeed they are not just parallel, they really interact. So that's aphasia, and then I will be moving to multilingualism, which as hope is one of the main focus of my uh, work recently, but it's not a talk about kind of bilingual advantage. So I will mention some of those things, but this is not the main focus. The main focus would be on pseudoscientific and particularly pseudo-neuroscientific foundations of linguistic colonialism and of the so-called monolingual default approach. And that will lead us automatically to the kind of political dimensions of the bilingual advantage debate. And I want to finish in the last slides with ideas of some practical implications. First in medicine from diagnosis to treatment, but also in policy from lifelong learning to issues of the centers. Okay, so let me start by a kind of quick, my quick autobiography, roots and roots. So I grew up in the place called Krakow in Poland, which is the picture on the left upper side, a beautiful city. And as it happens, I was a child of a Polish speaking father and German speaking mother, both of them being bilingual in both languages. So it was very easy for them to raise me, uh, to raise me uh, bilingually. Why didn't it happen? Where? Because of the prejudices against bilingualism that were at that time shared by professionals. So my mother was pediatrician, my father was a general doctor. They ask, you know, they ask pediatricians and, um, and speech and language therapists and so on. And the advice was, no, it's dangerous if a child speaks, you know, grows up with two languages, it will end up confused and maybe even schizophrenic. So the view of professionals in late 60s in Poland. Then I studied medicine in Germany. So here's the Hamburg Tsar on the French border, Hamburg in the north. And then I moved to Freiburg in Breisgau in the south, uh, on the border to France and Switzerland, where I did my doctorate on aphasia. So I was already then interested in languages, and I wanted to find something which combines the two topics. And aphasia, language disorders caused by brain disease, was an obvious uh, theme. 
Then I worked uh, for many years clinically in psychiatry and neurology, first in Bern, so that's the picture on the right up, then Berlin, as you will recognize, probably Brandenburg Gate, Cambridge, and since 2006 in Edinburgh. So this is, so to say, my, my roots in terms of where I come from and my roots in terms of places through which I went, which left a trace in the way I'm thinking and I am, I am considering things. So now uh, I mentioned moving to Edinburgh in 2006 and what I think is for me a very important aspect of being here is trying to combine the local and the global. Uh, so on the one hand I find Scotland beautiful and fascinating and one of the first things I did coming to Edinburgh was to enroll in a Gaelic course. And although I have to say my progress was been rather slow, I got very interested in all the issues you know, connected with Gaelic. And I did research on Gaelic English bilingualism in the Western Isles. So these are the uh, Outer Hebrides uh, from Lewis to Barra in the, uh, in the uh, West. Uh, but I also worked on Gaelic learners, sometimes from zero in Salmor Ostak, which is a Gaelic college on the Isle of Skye, where in fact I attended myself a one week course to get the experience myself about something that I'm researching on, and even a study about children in Gaelic medium education in Edinburgh. So from this point of view, I think I feel very, very much rooted now in Scotland in, the, in its linguistic context. And maybe if we have time or maybe in discussion, we can come to the issue of the kind of third language in Scotland, Scots, whether it's the dialect and so on. So I have to say I feel very, very happy in Scotland. And, and I find it in many respects fascinating from geology to languages. But at the same time, my work has been also international. So as was mentioned, I was working uh, in the years 2010 to 18 as president of the World Federation of Neurology Research Group on Aphasia, Dementia and Cognitive Disorders. And in this function, we organize our meetings in Istanbul, Turkey, in Hyderabad, a legendary meeting, I would say, which I think many people would perceive as a little highlight, and also a brilliant meeting in Hong Kong. So in a way, very much the idea we should not have meetings as they used to be before, just between North America and Western Europe. My predecessors, John Hodges and Arjun Healy, started it with me, in fact, Andrew Curtis with meetings in Budapest, so Eastern Europe, then we extend to South America. We had meetings in Brazil and Argentina. So in a way, it was very much, I felt, as my mission. And I would say I still feel like, you know, we need to move to Africa. So I feel a little bit like Moses, you know, before the, before the um, a promised land that for me, you know, I still hope to see Africa on a meeting. I've been on several meetings there, but haven't organized one. And But we also did courses, teaching courses in cognitive neuro as part of World Federation of Neurology um, program, uh, Cognitive Clinics Worldwide in uh, Latin America. So the picture here is from Ecuador, from Quito, but we are also in Colombia, in Cartagena, we are in Cuba, in Havana, but also in Middle East, Iran, India several times, China several times, and up to Mongolia. So the picture on the right is Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia. And in the same time, I did research in a lot of research in India. That's why I see Aladi, my, Aladi, my colleague who is the lead author on most of those papers. And we have many since 2013. That's why I say since 2013, but also I had a PhD student from Singapore and from China. So basically moving into these areas and currently I have uh, students working on, on other places, Malta, which are quite interesting. So I always try, as I say, to have a, on one hand a strong local, roots, but also looking as globally as possible. And my relationship to linguistics, well, my friend and colleague Martin Haspelmatt, here on the picture on the right, described me once as linguist uh, of the fighting buildings fake, which basically means a, a someone who, uh, I mean, in Germany, fighting buildings fake are people who didn't, you know, do uh, A-levels, they started working and at some point they think, oh, maybe I should really do A-levels, go to the university. So they try to kind of, on the side of their usual professional work, to learn something new. And that's how I feel a little bit about, about linguistics. And, uh, and uh, I did in my, in my time of doctorate in Freiburg in Breisgau, I was very, very happy 
uh, that you know I ended up I was fortunate really to be in a group <clears throat> which had a lot of uh, interdisciplinary interaction between neurologists, psychologists and linguists. We had meetings jointly, we were discussing how to approach it. And in fact, the introduction to my PhD thesis was already something which is very much still the essence of my work nowadays. Namely, I have three chapters, the neurological approach to language disorders, the psychological approach and the, and the uh, linguistic approach. Uh, then I was uh, very fortunate to encounter linguists. Uh, I mean, I read a lot of books, went to lectures, to summer schools at Cornell, uh, in linguistic report in Cagliari, and encounters with Martin Haspelman and Nick Evans, who are both uh, by now close friends of mine. And uh, by the way, if I have the light yellow here, this means that those people have also spoken in the Abralin series. I presume many of you know it. If you don't know, you certainly should. I think the Association Brasileira de Linguistica, the Brazilian Linguistic Association, organized a fantastic series starting from you know last last May, I think, which is now I mean freely accessible and it's like a library of very different types of linguistics. So in a way, if I have this light uh, uh, yellow color, it just means that these are people, you can just put the name if you go to Abrani websites uh, and then you will find it. Uh, then I encounter linguistic questions, I would say throughout my professional life in different contexts. When I was in Switzerland, my very first clinical work in Bern, my first patient was in fact a refugee from Somalia who spoke Somali, Amharic, some Arabic, but practically no overlap with uh, languages that I knew. So from this point of view, I was in, from the beginning involved in questions of language and thoughts disorders and so on. And that is an important point. Even if we work only in Western countries, the, the world becomes so global that we will have patients who might come from other places. So from this point of view, I think a global outlook is not only necessary if you want to work in your countries or if you want to learn something new and interesting. It is necessary in order to provide proper service for people, even if we stay at home, if this is Western Europe or North America. Uh, then I was very interested back in my Cambridge time in the question of involved cognition, was working on verb dissociations. Then, as I mentioned, my time as president of the research on aphasia and my recent work, multilingualism, cognitive aging, stroke, and dementia. And the last thing I want to kind of add to you know, set the scene is that for me, the lockdown became a kind of excursion into a different world. I mean, I was due on sabbatical where the lockdown started, and I could do only the very first bit of it in Ireland. I had already visiting professorship at Neem Hansen Bangalore in India, arranged arranged visit to China, and in fact, a field trip to Papua New Guinea, and I'm afraid everything had to be cancelled. So in a way, the way I tried to compensate was to try to read, but not necessarily the things from my very close, so to say, you know, center of interest, but really read beyond trying to do my exotic journey that I couldn't do in person in mind. Uh, and, you know, it's like a tour of new places. So I was reading a lot of books you can see here of sociolinguistics, which was a really exciting thing for me. Meeting new people online, for instance, through listening to Abraham talk and reflecting on my own approach. And as I say, particular interest in sociolinguistics here, a person whom I met basically through Ablalin is Sal Caliamonte, with whom I had a lot of Zoom meetings now since then, uh, very, very enriching uh, intellectually. And it became clear to me that in fact in medicine, we have something that is quite close to the approach of sociolinguistic, which we call the biopsychosocial model of medicine. And that is that in order to understand the patient disorder, to make a diagnosis, and particularly to manage the disease and treat it, we need to look at the kind of triangle of biology, the biological factors, the psychological individual factors, and the social surrounding. So this is something which in a way doesn't come so surprising for someone with a medical background. However, if I think back to 1980s, when I started working in aphasiology, the, I would say, academic landscape, research landscape was very, very different. The 
predominant view was so-called modularism. So the idea was, I mean, an incredibly influential book in 80s was Jerry Fodor's 1983, A Modularity of Mind. And the idea, so you see a picture of this book on the, on the right, and the idea that basically you have this kind of informationally encapsulated modules in the brain, and much of the theorizing at that time was like the modules you can see here, bo so-called box and arrows modules. So here, here we have this module, here it moves to another module, it can be disconnected, this module can be impaired. And it was certainly influenced by the information technology at the time. The computers were very modular and were predetermined. It was long before, let's say, parallel distributed processing developed and uh, artificial learning uh, and you know, learning things. And of course, linguistics was very strongly determined through generative grammar. And of course, out of this, the idea of autonomy of language. So language, and particularly syntax, has nothing to do with anything else. And therefore, studying language disorders was studying selective deficits that can say as, okay, in this case, the grammar module, the syntax module has been knocked out by disease. It was not terribly successful explaining anything that we are seeing with patients. So people were searching for the selective and stable impairments of the grammar module. But whereas you do have selective impairments, but the selectivity was rarely just one thing. It was very often a combination of different things. And very important, that was the topic of my PhD, was the dynamic character of aphasia, the changes, acute aphasia, so the aphasia in the first six weeks, and then development of later. Uh, we noticed that the impairment was not stable. So for instance, Broca's aphasia developed only after at least three months of duration. So if this was really a product of the normal brain minus the module of syntax, why don't we see it immediately? Why don't we see it only several months later on? Well, the answer to it will come later is that maybe it was due to compensation. So it was not just the aphasia, it was how the brain reacts to it in a non-modular fashion or multimodular. And that also meant that the assessment and treatment was focused on theoretically motivated features. So for instance, there's an enormous number of studies of passive, but for instance, very little on questioning or negation because passive was considered the kind of the classical example of the transformation between deep and surface structures. So therefore, you know, whole generations of physiologists were trying to find out whether by studying passive, we can, so to say, understand the selective nature of the deficit. Now, needless to say for this audience, this was incredibly language specific because in many situations in which English would use passive, other languages, use different things. So for instance, Spanish might be using reflexive or Polish might be using a change in word order because in Polish, of course, the roles are marked by the grammatical endings, by the final morphemes. So you don't really need passive because if you want to refocus a sentence, you just change the word order and the meaning doesn't get lost. So it became clear to me with time that firstly, this kind of modular thinking doesn't really do justice to the dynamic nature of aphasia and particularly to the developments, to the changes and recovery that we see in patients. And secondly, it doesn't really do justice to linguistic diversity. So looking back now, I wish I would have started reading about sociolinguistics many decades earlier because it would save us a lot of work in vain. Because one of the things that sociolinguists are looking at is the variation. The variation is the approach. And we could have done the aphasia as well. In fact, some people like Hermann Kolk and, um, um, and I think it was it Klaus Haitian, exactly, in Nijmegen, uh, were looking that, for instance, the agramalism was different depending which context patients, whether, for instance, they had time or whether they were pressed for time and so on and so on, you could change the degree. So there was a variation in grammatical speech, which basically most people treated just as a nuisance because either something is destroyed and then it shouldn't work at all or is preserved and it should work perfectly. There was no space for any gradation in these modular models, but for a variation in sociolinguist that would have been, of course, look at the variation and the variation will tell you something. And that 
so to say, we had much longer time, and I would say now it would fit very nicely to see aphasia syndromes as products of compensation. So I would say Broca's aphasia is a classical example. It's not just normal brain minus the syntax module, it's compensation for it. The other thing which I find very important from the point of view of sociolinguistic is to see a patient as an agent, not just as the name says patient, just being there and enduring things. Here I have just one example, I mean, that can be, you know, can, there can be many. When I was uh, examining a patient with semantic dementia, which is a condition in which people lose most of the vocabulary and are left only with very, very few high frequency words. And this patient was speaking about loneliness after her husband has died and she was living alone. And when I asked her how she felt, I will never forget her words because she said, when I am at my place, it's only me and the place. Well, now I would say for me, this is probably the most poetic and moving description of loneliness I have ever heard. You really feel the emptiness of a room in which there is only place and the person. And yet it is achieved with very, very little methods, very little vocabulary. So I will come to this issue about seeing people as agents and not only as objects of pathological changes in a few slides where we'll be speaking about aging and language. But then, as I mentioned, taking variation seriously means also that we need to look how aphasia lives in different languages. And that is a study which I did much later with a brilliant PhD and a student of mine who became later a PhD student now uh, is becoming more and more senior in the university, uh, Madeleine Beveridge. And uh, the idea was, let's look on the basis of which languages is our knowledge of aphasia based. So until 1945, most of the research has been predominantly conducted in German and French. Then this person on the right, who is one of my idols in the history of neurology, Arnold Pick, a Moravian Jew who spent most of his work in, in Prague, uh, he stressed repeatedly the importance of cross-linguistic studies. And he had a remarkably good knowledge. I mean, after all, he was living in an incredibly multilingual Austro-Hungarian empire in which probably most people spoke several languages. He was fluent in German and Czech, probably also in Yiddish, but he had some working knowledge of languages like Hungarian and, and Romanian. At least it, uh, he makes very, very good remarks, for instance, about you know uh, issues that are linked language specific. Uh, however, unfortunately, I would say that you know there were very few people like him taking such a broad view. And since 1945, we have a very, very clear dominance of English. There has been some increase of interest in cross-linguistic studies around 1990s, much of it inspired by Elizabeth Bates, a fantastic researcher from California who spent some time in Italy and was very interested in language comparison. But uh, unfortunately, after her early death, it became a little bit not going on, on again. So what Mara has done was to look at aphasiology journals and look what were, I mean, the most important aphasiology journals, and then what is the language of the patients that are reported? And 1,000 papers, and not surprisingly, the number one was really English, 61. So more than half the papers were only on English-speaking patients. There were less on German, Italian, and Dutch, French, Spanish. So you see, we are still in practically two only groups of Indo-European languages, Germanic and Romance. Chinese, the first non-Indo-European language, is 2.5. Five, Greek, Hebrew, the second on European, and all other languages have less than 1%. So we have quite a lot of imbalance, but what is much more important than just these numbers is this slide. And that was Madden's idea, which I think was brilliant. She said, well, let's look at which impact they have. Let's look at the number of citations. Now, if, when we looked at papers which were cited 30 to 50 times, there were 21 of them, 15 on English-speaking patients, three on Italian. Over 50, only on English speaking patients. So that means the 61% is an incredible underestimation because what is the case is that almost all theories are built on the basis of English and then 
you know, maybe someone, because there was a PhD student, let's say, you know, from Thailand, goes back to Thailand, maybe he went to Thai. There's a PhD student from Greece, will go to Greece, and maybe he went to Greece, and so on. So, the, or Basque country. So, basically, you have a complete theory building in English, and then only a kind of, uh, so to say, looking whether they were other languages. The theory is not built on the base of Paris, it is built on the base of English. And even more significant, particularly for me, from the point of view of practitioner, of clinician, is that on aphasia treatment, 85% of studies are on English speaking, and over 90 on English, German, and Dutch. So basically, what, wherever you are in the world, and whatever language you speak, you will be probably treated as if you were a monolingual English speaker, although it would be completely inappropriate for your language. And I will show examples in the next slide. Just to explain the picture on the right, here you see different etiologies, and the reason why I think it's quite important is because you see that, for instance, semantic dementia, which you know, led to a lot of studies looking at the kind of, you know, the structure of semantic memory in people, is much less represented in anything else than English or Western languages. So, in a way, what we believe to know about the semantic system, we know about semantic system in English. So now you could say, but well, aren't all languages more or less the same anyway? And are all those differences just, you know, superficial? Well, there are studies showing that, you know, if this does play a role. So for instance, grammatical gender, something which of course will never come up if you look through English because English doesn't have it, but an incredibly common feature, I would say in almost all Indo-European languages with the exception of English, Bengali, and a cluster of languages around Iran, I mean, Persian, uh, Armenian, and so on. Apart from that, almost all Indo-European languages have grammatical gender. Uh, and of course, Semitic languages with grammatical gender as well, Arabic or, or um, Hebrew. So very, very little work. But we know, for instance, in aphasia, in, uh, aphasia studies in German, that patients can be cued, for instance, through their, the, das, through the article, if they know the gender, they might find it easier to use words. A whole way of doing things which is not used because the therapies were developed for English speakers. There is also something opposite. You can have selective problems there. So semantic dementia patients, I mentioned to you, lose all the low frequency items and are reverted to high frequency lexicon. However, that is not only in terms of words, but also of their grammar. So in Spanish, there is a class, I mean, usually words uh, finishing with O will be masculine, with A will be feminine, but there is a cluster of words finishing with A, usually of Greek, ancient Greek origin, which are, uh, which are uh, uh, masculine, like dogma. Those patients will pronounce them as la, so they will overgeneralize grammatical rule. So it's not only a lexical, it's also a grammatical problem in semantic dementia, and we would never find it out if we don't look beyond languages, for instance, which have no gender, or looking at other things classified in Chinese, and so on and so on. A very interesting question, Demantic, I would say semantic dementia allows us to study whether the classifier system in Chinese is part of semantics or part of syntax. Now, another study which appeared just uh, this year, uh, now use of pronouns. It is said that in Alzheimer patients, uh, when they have language uh, problems, that they overuse pronouns. Bengali patients, Bengali speaking patients, seem to underuse them. So again, what we believe to be something universal is just an artifact of one language, and it might be exactly the opposite in other languages. And then, you know, one uh, point of interest for me for a long time, because I come from Polish, which is a very inflectionally rich language, uh, it has implications for assessment. You know, in English, if you can name a word, then you can use it. You have the word house, and, uh, or let's say the word dream, and then you can say, oh, about the dream, and uh, tell me about this dream, and so on. In Polish, the word dream, which is sen, will be changed depending what we say, snu, śnie, snem, and so on, and so on. The word ho, house is dom, but if you go home, you have to say the domu. Uh, if you speak about the home, you speak or, or domie, and so on, and so on. So basically, knowing nominative doesn't allow you really to use the language fluently. 
in a language like Polish, but also interesting for instance, in Dravidian languages in southern India, so it's not just exclusively Indo-European, uh, whereas in English it can. So you get a wrong impression of the ability if you only look at the narratives. In others in treatment, I mentioned in most of the European languages in Western Europe, Romance and, and Germanic, the nouns are usually relatively simple. You have two grammatical forms, the plural and singular, often very regular, uh, at least in many languages, and then you have a very, very complex verb morphology. So you start treatment with nouns and then you move to verbs. However, if you have a language where the nouns are quite complex, you do the opposite. And for instance, Alexander Romanovich Luria, a very important Russian, um, a, you know, a physiologist and a neuroscientist, he designed a whole treatment where the starts, which was the simplest in Russian, namely nouns in imperative, uh, verbs in imperative, and nouns are coming last because they have to be declined. So you need to know the six grammatical forms. So here just examples, it does matter. It's not just, so to say, that we use other forms. You get very different pictures and we don't do justice to patients by treating them all if they were just some kind of variant of English. Now, you can ask, of course, okay, so what happens when a patient who is bilingual develops aphasia? Well, in most cases, aphasia will affect both languages, but there are also cases of differential impairment in which one language is more impaired than other, percent, and selective deficits in which only one language is impaired. And now, of course, the next obvious question is, which one? Well, the first idea goes back to the 19th century. First language is best preserved. That was the idea of Ribot, uh, so-called Ribot's law. So basically, the earlier acquired information is more stable than the later acquired. But only 14 years later, Pitre in France proposed something opposite. It's the last language, the language that was used most that is best preserved. It could be the emotionally relevant language, which might not be neither the first nor the last or the relevant language after aphasia, so the language that patient is surrounded by the moment he, so to say, wakes up, let's say, from stroke or head injury and so on and so on. And indeed, there are studies suggesting that you can have different type of aphasia in the same patient, like a case of Albert and Obler, Broca's aphasia in English, Wernicke aphasia in Hebrew. Now, this is about aphasia which in most cases in this studies were caused by stroke. Now, what happens in dementia and what happens in healthy aging? Because to understand disease, we need to understand what happens in healthy aging. Now, let me start by saying that, uh, you know, one of the problematic artifacts of, let's say, the uh, or the generative, generativist bias in the 80s or so was that language was seen as something which is kind of acquired early on and then stable for the rest of your life. So the first years are important, then you know comes the critical period and the rest is the same. Now we understand now that language is changing all the time as long as we are alive, our language is changing. And again, I would not need to explain to a sociolinguist who you know has done a lot of research on that. So, for instance, here on the right, we have studies where we showed a significant shift in language use after retirement for obvious reasons, because after retirement, so here, for instance, Gaelic English bilinguals in the Western Isle of Scotland, during working time, they had to speak English because it's enough to have one non-Gaelic speaker and there is a social pressure to speak only English. But once they retired, they could spend the time with people who might speak the language they preferred. So many of them moved to a much higher use of Gaelic, whereas others used practically only English. So you might have a lot of shifts after retirement. And again, it's an interesting question how we explain it. Traditionally, the, a lot of explanation is biological, temporal gradient of memory loss. So maybe people move, move to the first language because like in I mentioned, I think in Alzheimer's disease and dementia, we tend to forget recent memory and we, uh, we have a better memory for remote past. So it would make sense in the context of Alzheimer to move back to, so to say, to the first language. It could be declining cognitive flexibility. It could be social withdrawal and isolation because we have less, so to say, contact with people. And there were, in fact, sociolinguistic theories of the kind of the, the linguistic or sociolinguistic marketplace, which then gets less relevant if we don't work. 
and in fact, even kind of more psychological, developmental explanation of nostalgia for the childhood in its language. What I find strange is that there is hardly anybody who even considers that this might be also freedom to choose. When I'm working, I have no choice. I have to spend most of my time speaking English. But once I retire, I will probably make an effort to use other languages, which I really enjoy speaking, being Polish or German or Spanish, and of course not giving up English completely, but you know, it will be one of many. So from this point of view, there is also an element of freedom of choice. And that is something which comes back to what I said before about speaker as agent, that we almost never think of a speaker as agent. Speaker is passive object of the changes around him. Now, this is, so to say, the idea why it happens, but is it really practically relevant? Of course it is, because it will have relevance for which languages should be test, used for cognitive testing. So if we test a bilingual in language that he is less or she, less proficient in or less used and so on, we might get wrong results about the cognitive ability. So in some way, it's a very important question because on this question might depend whether someone is diagnosed as dementia or not. And based on that, I am now involved in studies uh, looking at uh, practically language changes in language use. I mean, many studies we cannot do now because of the of the COVID, but we can do quite a lot of online studies. So we have now, for instance, one uh, here, one uh, ongoing study, and this is Brittany Blankenship, my PhD student, who is working on that, uh, where we are looking at uh, people over fifty, but also people who know. So you can do this. Uh, practically this survey, more than once, you can do it for your, once yourself if you're over 50, but you can do it on anybody you know from your friends or family who might be over 50 with the question, do they change their habits? Do they prefer to go back to the first language? Do they mix languages? And so on and so on. So in a way, as I say, we have it already in several languages, English, Spanish, Chinese, Tamil, and Greek. And uh, I would be thrilled if, you know, one of the byproduct of this of this um, lecture would be you know, some more people, so to say, adding their, their experience. And what we found is a big, big variety. So in many cases, there's no change. People basically speak the same number of languages and same proficiency, same frequency. So it's not always that you know, things must change. You have cases where you have equal changes in all languages, and they can be negative, but also positive. There were people who are telling us they feel more fluent, in fact, when they get older maybe also more balanced because they can use, let's say, both or all three languages rather than the one that is dictated by work. There are some changes in language preference pattern of use, and we did find many people going back to regression or reversal, return, whatever you would like to call it, every word is kind of a bit problematic with this ideology, but that's a different topic in itself. Uh, so following the Ribot's law, but we found also the phenomenon of L1 attrition, so the advantage for later on language and disadvantage for the first one, so that would be the precursor. And we find language mixing, and you could say, oh, well, but now we are really, you know, in former days we were speaking about language mixing negatively, but now we are enlightened and we know this is, you know, code switching and something very good rather than problematic. Well, it's not necessarily if you use languages with people who cannot understand it. And that is what happens, for instance, in many cases. And unfortunately, I know it from the experience of my own mother, who in kind of her last last weeks in hepatic encephalopathy, who was mixing Polish and German to people who didn't speak one of those, and usually didn't speak Polish. Now, in dementia, in contrast, you seem to have mainly reversal. That's the result so far. But there's one important caveat. Many of those reports we get from the children, and the children very often don't know the language of their parents. I mean, across the world, we have a situation that many immigrants are forced, or let's say encouraged, however you want to say, to speak the, lock, the language of the new country and give up the original language. And that is the case in, in, many, in many cases. Let me just look. So here, the program, I just went back to show you that. So the program here, uh, which I very much recommend, BBC Lost for Words, very recent one, where I was speaking and uh, with um, and, and Brittany with David Chariot Madari, a writer and journalist 
whose father was Persian and moved to England. Children didn't learn Persian, but uh, David went to Soas to learn Persian. And what he noticed is everybody assumed that his father was going back to Persian speaking fluent Persian and losing his English. But because he knew some Persian, he realized that the parents, that the, that the father also made some errors in, in uh, Persian. So the point is, some of this reversal might be due to the fact that the children don't understand the language and they seem the same if the patient, so to say, their father or grandfather is speaking something they don't understand, it must be perfect origin language, whereas it might be quite different as well. And that leads me to a kind of second bit of this talk about, you know, I started already speaking about multilingualism. And again, I find it very, very interesting. If we look back through human history, I would say there are two very contrasting narratives of bilingualism. So there is this negative view, and it's negative both in the social and in the individual level. So the idea is that it divides society, it needs to intergenerational schizophrenia, which was the word, by the way, used by David Blanket, a labor home secretary in England in aftermath of the 9-11, where basically his idea was that you know people become terrorists because these people do at home rather than English. Uh, quite shocking views, but you know, just relatively recently. So the idea is that you know having more than one language means that the society falls apart. And for the individual, it means that it confuses. So in some way, I would say it's the same thing at the level of society and of and of uh, individual, the idea that it is splitting, weakening. And of course, this is often associated with ideologies of linguistic superiority. But you have the other narrative that it's enriching, enriching for society, multiculturalism, liberalism, that a society is richer when it has different languages and it's richer for the individual. Now, the reason I have this kind of different pictures here is because it's not East and West. I mean, some people will know me that I'm quite allergic against this kind of straightforward comparison between the Western world and non-Western world, as if Western world would be kind of homogeneous and non everything which is non-Western would be kind of same. It's a little bit like, you know, dividing languages of the world only into groups, English and non-English. So here on the left, you have, for instance, the examples of very, very multilingual societies, the Persian Empire of Persepolis, the ancient India or modern India as well. And here Mithridates, a Greek a king of Pontius, who was famous for the fact that he was boasting that he speaks all languages of his 27 languages of his subject so that he can converse with every of his subjects in his own language. On the right, you have, you know, I would say some English kings were not necessarily famous for the linguistic tolerance, I'm afraid. But also I would say the Incas were relatively, from what I know, relatively kind of putting Quechua, so to say, as the official language. So it's not East against West to find these two narratives across all times and across different societies. And for me, one of the best examples of the kind of negative narrative is this work by Sir in British Journal of Psychology, so a very well established journal on effects of bilingualism on intelligence. And he speaks about the lack of definiteness in meaning in bilinguals, and then confusion, which is carried over from the brain area connected with language to those connected with other functions. The interesting point is, Serre had no clue about language. He was a teacher. He had absolutely no background in be it medicine, be it neuroscience, be it neuroanatomy, and so on. It was simply clear for him that speaking Welsh in this case must be bad for your brain. Speaking English is good. So you see here how a pseudo neuroscientific explanation is used. And to make it even more beautiful, he has also a psychoanalytic explanation why it's so bad to be bilingual, because you have an emotional conflict not relieved by the cathartic play, which can reconcile the reality principle. So basically, in English kids, they have an English super ego, English id, and that can be nicely reconciled. Welsh kids have an English super ego, Welsh id, and that must lead to a conflict. So this is a pseudo-psychological and pseudo-scientific, pseudo-neuroscientific argument. Is it really about the brain? Well, I would say this citation shows that it's all about political. So here he writes, in the beginning of his paper, the use of the native language in a subject state tends to weaken in favor of the language of the governing state. 
yet a people will not readily abandon their language and adopt another. Of course, they should. And now we have it. Under British rule, there are many people who speak other tongues, and consciously and unconsciously, the English language is coming gradually to prevail in the subject states of Britain, thank God. The natives, during this process, passing through various stages of alienism. So here you have the view. There are basically three stages of human linguistic development. The highest is to be a monolingual native speaker. The lowest is to be a monolingual speaker of anything that is not English. And in between, you have people which are already a little bit better because they speak some English, but they are still somewhat, you know, somewhat tainted by a non-English language that is still sticking to them. And they should get rid of it. So that is for me a wonderful example how basically a colonialist and I mean occasionally, in fact, racist view of language is being sold as neuroscientific by someone who has no clue about neuroscience. Now, just to say, it's not that everybody in the time should the same. So a kind of, for me, a wonderful counterexample is Lev Sinanovich Vygotsky, a very important Russian writer. And he writes, in fact, how learning another language liberates our mind. I mean, it's a beautiful, I mean, you know, the, the translation doesn't really do justice to the beautiful original where he really says that asfabajdayet, that means liberate. So the thought is liberated from the concreteness of the one language, practically through learning, learning others. So a completely opposite idea, an idea that we are in prison of one language, as long as you are monolingual, and learning other languages to a level that we can really process thoughts in them, liberates us and elevates us to a higher level. I very much recommend this, this Vygotsky book, I mean, the uh, so uh, thinking and uh, language. Now, interestingly, it was in a very specific political situation that these ideas, let's say Anglo-Saxon dominance ideas, uh, you know, that monolingual Anglo-Saxon is the best, has been challenged. And that was in Quebec in the 60s, the time of so-called quiet revolution, the Revolution Tranquille, where, as you can see, the Quebecois started reasserting the linguistic rights. The uh, sentence here was, maintenant jamais, now or never, maître chez nous. We want to be masters in our own house. And in this context, Pilem Lambert did an incredibly influential study in 19. 62, showing that in fact it's exactly the opposite. If you compare, if you match people for socioeconomic background, which of course the Ser didn't do, so he was comparing people, Welsh speakers from disadvantaged families with kind of posh and rich English speakers, and here they were looking at people which were practically uh, you know, matched for this, and suddenly in fact the bilinguals have outperformed. So it was not only not a disadvantage was an advantage. And over the following years, there has been a lot of work, and particularly by the lady you can see down here, Ellen Białystok, who also gave a fantastic talk in uh, Abralin, so you can also look it in Abralin. And she found that in children, in fact, if anything, there's an improvement in metalinguistic skills, so the knowledge of, uh, of language, the kind of thinking about language, but also in social cognition and in executive functions. Executive functions are things like attention, switching, so things that are, so to say, not only bound on language, bound to language, and which allow us to function, to manipulate the knowledge that we have and put it in the relevant context. Very, very important. I mean, some of the most important, so to say, functions in the brain. And while the first work was mainly focused on children, 2004, they found the same in older participants, and 2007, they found a delay in the uh, dementia of about four to five years in people who are bilingual. Now, this was, of course, an absolute wake-up call because suddenly bilingualism became a topic of dementia research, which I found absolutely exciting. And I had a good chance to kind of get together with Suvarna Aladi, my friend and colleague, whom I met already in Cambridge before, and uh, she went back to her native Hyderabad, which is a good example of a place 
of a frequent and a bilingualism which is not associated with immigration. Because one of the criticisms against the wisdom study was that basically it is very much a, a, an immigration effect because in Toronto, of course, or in Canada, generally or US, mainly most multilinguals or bilinguals, multilinguals will be in France. But here it's exactly, uh, you know, both sides. I mean, Hyderabad has been multilingual for, you know, 500 years at least, probably more. So we could study multilingualism not connected to uh, immigration in a place where, in fact, about 60% are multilingual with excellent clinical services, a Cambridge style cognitive clinic and multilingual tests and stuff. This is important because a lot, for instance, of American studies are looking at different patients, but they are all tested only in English. And then they don't really care whether English might be the better or less language. If they perform less than English monolinguals, then they will be diagnosed as demented. That was not something which happened in the study here. By the way, the same could happen, of course, of course also in English. So I'm not saying it's kind of just American and it happens in countries where you have a very much normative monolingualism that very often the whole diagnosis is just borderline mal one language and they'll assume that, you know, if you don't do it well, that's your problem. We found very similar results to a four years delay. And interestingly, because in India you have people who are illiterate and multilingual, we found a difference even bigger than illiterates. So it's not about bilingualism being a marker of better education. In people who have no school education whatsoever, cannot read and write, multilingualism offers an even bigger delay in the symptoms of dementia. And the way how it is explained usually is the concept of cognitive reserve. I cannot go into that much detail because I have still a couple of other things I want to share with you. But the idea basically that particularly with executive sim, uh, functions that having more than one language and using different languages is basically a permanent training for our mind as we have to activate one language, disactivate the other, combine them, and so on, and so on. And if this is the case, then we should find the differences, not only in dementia, but also in other diseases, for instance, stroke. Stroke is often associated with cognitive disorders. So we did a second big study of 600 stroke patients, again, around 60% bilingual, which is more or less what you find in the population of Hyderabad. Now, the important thing is there was no difference in age of stroke. So it means being bilingual doesn't give you a general better health. You might get stroke this way or the other but the outcome was best there. So again, the brain can compensate better. So here you see normal cognition, 20% of monolinguals, 40% of bilinguals, and global aphasia. So you can equally, you have equal chances to get aphasia, whether it's monolingual or bilingual, but it will be more pronounced, global, more severe in monolinguals. So very, very dramatic difference, I would say, in outcomes, depending on language you speak. So we have two most common cognitive disorders which are influenced by bilingualism. And then the question of course arises, can it be that maybe simply people who are brighter are more likely to learn a language? So we have something called the reverse causality. It's not that language learning is good for your brain, it's that bright people are more likely to learn a language. Well, not an easy question to ask, but there is data for that. And that comes from so-called Lozi and Berskogol study. So here we have a, a I mean, Scotland is quite unique in that in 1947, it tested all kids who were 11 at that time, so born in 36, in several cognitive tests, intelligence tests. And Ian Deary, whom you can see on this picture, could basically get the data of about 1,000 people from the area of Lothian, which is the area of Edinburgh. And here you can see, so we can look at the same people, how they perform when they were 11, how they perform now. Now we know that childhood intelligence predicts, of course, later intelligence. So kids that were, you know, at the top level, top 5% are likely to be top level also when they are older. And those who are at the lower 5% are likely to be at the lower. It's not one-to-one, -one, it's not 100%, but there is a certain tendency. And what we could show is that the kids who learn another language and were able to communicate in more than one language perform better. And that was independent of childhood IQ. So they perform better than we could predict on the basis of the childhood IQ. Well, I think that was really quite a nice, you know, proof that it's not just, so to say, the intelligence, but it was not well received by everybody. 
So here I have a citation which was from a reader of, a, of the journal in or a newspaper in UK commenting on it. Of course, it's nice to have a second language, but I don't believe the science twaddle for one second. The human brain can only contain, so human brain, look, a, a finite amount of information. And as English speakers, we are fortunate not to need a secondary language. That space is much better utilized for science, history, and our rich culture. Now, judging by the fact that it was Daily Mail, I doubt whether this person was really a new scientist or someone with a particular knowledge of brain. But you can see here again how the argument about the brain is made in practice to justify, in this case, Anglo-Saxon linguistic superiority. You know, they, they have space in their brains for science, history, and rich culture, which of course other nations won't have because they have first learned English to become civilized, and therefore, uh, and therefore that space is taken away from other useful things. Now, this comes from different corners. So in fact, Lee Kuan Yew, well, he was trying to get people in Singapore away from speaking different variants of Chinese or Chinese dialects, some people say, but I would say they are as different from standard Chinese as different European languages would be in Europe. We have only two gigabytes of memory in our brain. I don't know where the citation comes from. Uh, there's no, certainly no reference for that. But here you have examples how, as I say, certain linguistic dominance ideology is being put forward with a pseudo neuroscientific argument. Now, I would say, if anything, I mean, that is something which I've been working on quite a lot. This is the opposition, which, you know, I was practically alluding to in the beginning, between the limited resources models, where brain is seen as like a chest of drawers, strict static localization, competition of space. And in fact, a kind of nice metaphor, which I have from John Joseph, a colleague of mine who gave also a nice Aberdeen talk, where he was comparing basically the, you know, some parts of neuroimaging to you know, every line is a lie. So the idea that we are, we have, so to say, we put lines like in nation states, we put, so to say, the boundaries in the brain. Now, I would say if there is any development in neuroscience over the last 25 years or so, it's exactly away from such notions to interactive notions where they, it is more than some of the ingredients. Dynamic localization, neuroplasticity, emphasis on learning and adaptation. So, in a way, our view of the brain now is, is about networks. So it's not that you know learning another language will push away space. It adds another thread to a net, and by it, it makes the net bigger. So basically, the problem with this uh, limited resources models is they sound very, very convincing intuitively, but in fact, they are exactly the opposite of all that we understand about the brain at the moment. And here you can see that modern models of bilinguals, there are two models done by the same uh, person, David Green, a very, very important, you know, one of the best thinkers in this field. And this is the model of 98, which you see is still very much box and arrows. And here you have the model that he put together with Jubin Abu Taleb in 2013, which is very much more interactive. So let me just come to the kind of last few slides. What are the kind of practical implications? One is, Maybe by learning a new language, we can improve our cognitive functions because we can't really change how we grow up or we cannot change our childhood and the attitude of our parents, but we can still learn something. And that are tests which I've been doing with two PhD students of mine on the left, uh, Mariana Vega Mendoza, on the right, uh, Nadine Long. And we found indeed that after four years of intensive language learning, attentional functions, so non linguistic, attention functions, counting tones up and down and so on, pretty mathematical task are improving. There was no difference the first year student, there was different fourth year student. And Mabi found that after an intensive course of Gallic, one week in Salmor Ostak, which I mentioned before, we found improvement in attention switching in all age groups from 18 to 85. So if you are under 85, please don't come to me with an argument, I am too old. If you are over 86, I might start thinking, but I still probably still think it's wrong. And interesting, we could say, well, of course, this is an effect of one week. It probably disappears after the other. Yes, but it persists in those who practice over five hours a week. So based on that, we have a social, I mean, uh, basically, the Robin Norval, whom you can see here, founded a social enterprise in Glasgow, 
which specifically teaches language classes to healthy elderly and to patients with dementia. And one of the things which we didn't think about, but is really interesting and important, is it counteracts loneliness and low self-esteem. So people really felt much better about their ability because he said, I might have dementia, I'm still able to learn something. I have something I can say with pride to my grandchildren. I have now learned some Italian or some Spanish. And very often they made friendships which then stayed and they stayed in touch with people from the class for longer. Another, just the last two slides before the, the summary, another important way is multilingual psychotherapy. Almost all new psychotherapy schools are English. They use English language, English terms, English abbreviations, English jokes, and so on and so on. What happens in a country like Uganda where practically everybody is multilingual? We know from sociolinguistic research that people use different languages in different contexts to regulate social, social, um, so to say, distance. Some wonderful neurolinguistic, uh, sociolinguistic studies of that. Well, I have a brilliant student, uh, Noah Stutter, an American, well, German American, who, and he practically found that indeed looking, speaking with uh, patients as well as psychotherapists, that practically all reported that they were switching languages in therapy, context dependent. So if you want to increase the bond, you move to the local African languages, it creates familiarity, jokes, prophecy, emotion, but you can distance yourself from negative experiences by moving to a language like English, where you have much less linguistic, uh, so to say, emotional involvement. So that means patients and, and um, uh, therapists can use switching between languages as an instrument of regulating emotional distance psychotherapy. Of course, there is very little research on that, except from some pioneering work by Ramak de Bele, because the assumption is that, of course, all psychotherapy should be done monolingually in English. And the interesting thing here was contrasting attribution to language switching. So the patient thought that the therapist decided which language they speak, and the therapist thought that the patient decided. So that is something we want to work with. And penultimate slide, just kind of very, very practical. We are now moving really into language policy. Census, how do we know which language is spoken in the country or not? But I would say UK is a wonderful example of real malpractice. I mean, really, really the worst possible. Now, in the national census in the UK, you can have multiple ethnic identities. You can be African and, you know, and South, South Asian, East Asian, and so on. You can have multiple national identities. You can feel, you know, British, European, Scottish, whatever but you are only allowed to speak one single main language. I spent a lot of time trying to explain to people from the Office for National Statistics that it's a bit like asking a parent who has several children, what is your main child? Is it the first or the last or the one which is you know, nicest or the one which makes more problems? It doesn't make sense for a multilingual, but there is this normative monolingual bias which permeates the British society, and it was, you know, it was one of the most frustrating experiences in my whole professional life, trying to explain to people, so that's the question. If you speak English, we are not interested because you speak any other languages. If you, do, if you speak something else, just one language, and then how will you speak English? And the argument is because we just need, because we need to provide medical information and so on different language. Now, rubbish for many reasons. Firstly, for instance, I might be speaking English now most of the time, but if I get dementia, and then I turn back to the first language, they will not even know which language it is. Interestingly, private hospitals ask you for language. So if you have good quality care, they know that it matters. And Guardian Carers, there's an organization with whom I work together, which really uh, said, I mean, they try to provide care in that language. This information will not be on the uh, census because you are only allowed to speak one language. And just, I mean, here's another PhD student of mine I want to mention, uh, Eva Maria Schnelten. So we are looking across the world at, you know, what other censuses do. Not all countries uh, conduct a census at all, and not all ask language questions, but those who ask, 73% of them allow multiple languages. And in fact, in many countries, you have up to five different questions about 
language proficiency, frequency, context of use. And we wrote to the statistical offices to find out what the output is. And the, I think the nicest answer we got from New Zealand, we collect all languages spoken as opposed to one primary or main language, as this would enable us to understand the multilingual nature of the New Zealand population. I wish Office, Office of National Statistics in the UK would be even half or quarter as enlightened. Okay, so let us come to the kind of last conclusions. I hope I was trying to show you that the way we understand the brain can involve or can have implications for language policy as much as the way we understand the language influences the view of the brain. So what we need is really what I call my Abraham talk, intercontinental interdisciplinarity, not just between neighboring disciplines, but between disciplines being very, very far apart, language policy, let's say, and medicine. Practical implications are many for diagnosis and treatment of diseases as common as stroke and dementia. Language use in therapy, language can be a tool of psychotherapy, but language learning can also be used as a type of therapy. And then finally, data collection, analysis, interpretation, and use, for instance, in UK, will have completely unreliable data of the census, so there will be no way telling how many languages are spoken in the UK because the Office of National Statistics is not interested in it. They want to make the country look as a monolingual, monolithic English speaker place. And finally, my appeal, I would be very grateful if you could uh, answer you know, any of our surveys. There's also a memory survey if you speak, I mean, we have it in many European languages, also we have it in Chinese and, and Tamil. And finally, as I say, I use Twitter quite a lot, so, after the talk, maybe you know later today or tomorrow, I will be tweeting a lot of links to the things I have mentioned. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope I will get some questions. <laughs>